The lowest level of interest rates since 1694. Dramatic news, but these are undoubtedly dramatic times. The government and the Bank of England have been using every tool in the toolkit. Well, nearly. There have been interest rate cuts galore. Since the autumn of 2007, when base rates were at 5.75%, the Bank of England's been hacking them back. At first, the cuts were slow, a quarter of a point here and a quarter of a point there. But in October of last year, it accelerated. First a half point, then a mammoth fall of 1.5%. And 1% again last month. Then, half an hour ago, it was cut again, right down to 1.5%. Then, of course, there have been the bailouts, £50 billion pounds to the banking system in October, followed by £37 billion to RBS, Lloyds and HBOS a week later. Not to mention the nationalisation of Northern Rock. And there's the tax cuts, VAT down to 15% and tinkering with stamp duty. But despite all this, we're not spending and banks don't seem to be passing much on. The problem at the moment, as we know only too well, is that there isn't enough money around being lent. So the challenge is to convert this to this. Generally, this is done by qualitative easing, in effect, lowering interest rates to make money cheaper. But with so little scope left there, they're now talking of something different, quantitative easing. That's, in effect, printing money to pump liquidity into the economy. The Bank of England may, for example, buy commercial loans or buy bonds and, in return, of course, give money. That money is then available to be lent to individuals or to companies. But there's scepticism over whether even that will work. Some say monetary policy alone isn't the answer, that public money should perhaps be spent on creating new institutions to directly support business and consumers. Well, James Ferguson is the chief strategist at Pali International and with us now. James, do you think this interest rate cut is going to make any difference at all to the economy? Um, unfortunately, not really. Um, the, the, in a normal environment, when the Bank of England cuts interest rates to the banks, it makes it cheaper for the banks to borrow money and therefore allows them to lend money to us cheaper and still keep their profit margins the same. Unfortunately, what we have right now is a banking crisis. The banks are um, have hugely over-leveraged. They have too many assets, loans already for the amount of capital they have. So it doesn't matter if you make it cheaper for them to lend to other people. What they've got to do is start contracting the amount of loans they have outstanding, let alone make any new ones. Then why do it? Why cause all this pain for savers? Why raise the hopes of borrowers that aren't going to be met with an interest rate cut that isn't going to be effective? The main reason is history. Um, back in 1929, we had a banking crisis in the, in the US, and they came up with the same arguments. And they said, well, why not, in fact, increase interest rates? Then at least savers will be doing well out of this, and they'll carry on spending. Now, we know that the three policy responses they did in 1929, uh, hiking interest rates, not bailing out the banks, and raising trade barriers, led to the most disastrous economic scenario we've ever seen in living memory. So it's, it's one of the three no-nos. We definitely do not raise rates. We do what we can. We know it won't have much effect, a very diluted effect, but it'll have some beneficial effect, and that's what we work on. So it's quantitative easing. That's what Gillian was speaking about earlier in her report. So other tools than monetary policy are needed. What can the bank do? Well, to a very large extent, the bank can't do very much. The problem with the banking crisis is that monetary policy, which the Bank of England sets, is, is uh, acted on in the real economy by the banking system. So if the banking system aren't playing ball, we've got a real problem. Virtually nothing gets through. So you cut interest rates as much as you can, down to the lowest possible level. If that still isn't working... To zero, perhaps? Uh, effectively, might not actually go quite to zero because there are problems with money market funds. Um, if you take the interest rate to zero, then money market funds who charge fees on top might actually be giving people a negative return. But somewhere very near, effectively zero anyway. Um, and then after that, you, what you do is you try and push interest rates down further out the, uh, the term structure or you try and increase the actual quantity of money available so that you're flooding the system with liquidity. This is very good for the banks in, in the terms of uh, their liquidity situation. They have lots of liquidity, and we're not going to have a northern rock where they run out of liquidity. But it doesn't solve the basic problem, which is the solvency issue. The banks aren't really in a position to, to lend, even if it's easy for them to lend. Uh, not in a position to lend because they're having to build up their own capital base, or not in a position to lend because they still don't know the value of those toxic assets that they've got on their books? Uh, both. I mean, uh, you know, a banking crisis is when the toxic assets are too big for the capital base. Now, the, the solution, therefore, is either bolster the capital base hugely, which we've tried and we've pretty much run out of funds, or contract the, uh, the risky assets uh, in a big way, which is what we're about to see, and that's going to be the very painful bit for the real economy. That means loans being foreclosed and, and companies being tipped into bankruptcy. All sounds very gloomy. James, thanks very much for joining us. James Ferguson, that's Chief Strategist at Pally International. James, thank you.